In May 2021, as part of the Unite to Prevent Fifth International Vatican Conference, Professor Nia Barzilai, MD of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Professor David Sinclair, PhD of the Harvard Medical School, discussed how to live healthily to the age of 120 and beyond. And there's a link in the description below to the full conference. All the difference is that uh, David's book is lifespan and my book is health span, but you cannot really actually distinguish between them because what we have found as geroscientists is that we can target aging and if we target aging, then we delay diseases and we live healthier. And so if we delay disease and live healthier, we'll also live longer. So in fact, we're talking about the same mechanism. And if there's any difference, it's just because for many people, uh, longevity somehow is a curse. They think that they live, they don't think that they live healthy as they live longer. And, and, um, and, and that's the thing that we kind of have to change. We can live healthier and the side effect is living longer. What's better? Well, like all good scientists, we do debate things. That's our job. But fortunately, over the last decade, we uh, longevity researchers, we call ourselves, have come upon a list of about eight major causes of aging that we all agree on. Um, and so some of these are well known. These are shortening of the ends of chromosomes, the telomeres, the loss of stem cells, uh, cellular senescence. Uh, these, cell these cells are like zombie cells that accumulate in the body the loss of mitochondria, which are the power packs of the cell. Um, and the list goes on. There's one called epigenetic alterations that may be a, a major part of that. But science is always uh, dynamic and we're discovering new things all the time. Um, but what we're really, I think, looking for here, which would be super exciting, is are there one or two major causes that lead to these other bad things that happen to our body? And in that way, we could theoretically intervene, slow down the aging process and stay much healthier for longer, as Nir mentioned, and therefore we live longer as a result. The, the major question is, if you get to 100, do you get your disease when you're 60 like everyone and all you do is live longer with disease? And the answer is not. Health span and lifespan in this population goes together. They live 20, 30 years healthier than, than, than a, a control group. And that's not what's most exciting. What's most exciting is that they have what we call a contraction of morbidity. They spend very little time at the end of their life sick. 30% of them just don't wake up in the morning. So, so we can achieve that. We are built in to achieve it. There are lots of genetic component to exceptional longevity, genetic component that slows aging. And one of the major one in our centenarian is the fact that all the growth hormone mechanisms are impaired. A lot of genes of growth are impaired because uh, we need the growth hormone when we are young to build the body. But then when our, with aging, our body starts to break down, we have to shift the energy from grow, growth to protection. And we can find it in our centenarians among other genes. recommend or suggest to live longer, it would be eat less often. Uh, we live in a world of abundance now with three meals and snacks. Uh, this is what it's actually doing to us besides make us obese is it's turning off our natural defenses against disease and aging that we have. And these are controlled by longevity genes that Nir and I and many others in the field have discovered. Um, so you want to put your body in a state of perceived adversity, run a little, move, lift weights, uh, eat less often, eat the right foods, and then your body responds and fights against deterioration. Um, unfortunately, the world that we have is we love comfort, and this is actually accelerating our aging. So we need to really just get off our behinds, um, don't eat so often, and, and get those longevity genes to work and protect us over the long run. Uh, so, first of all, David mentions the hallmarks of aging, and he mentioned that when you target one, you actually affect some of the others. 
And that's what happened with metformin. Actually, we published a paper showing that it detects all the hallmarks of aging. Why is it? It's really simple. It happens in the drugs that uh, David developed, the, the resveratrol kind of drugs and rapamycin, which is another drug. When you take the cell or organ and body and make it the, and from old to young, um, you're going to change all those hallmarks. And that's what happened when you have it through what we call geroprotection. Um, metformin for us is a tool uh, to get a new indication that is a prevention of age-related diseases, something that the FDA doesn't totally grasp. Nobody really grasped this concept yet. And that's why it's so important that we're here to show that we can prevent a bunch of age-related disease by just targeting aging more specifically. And so metformin is a drug that's safe, has been used for decades. It actually was used first to prevent flu and malaria when it was discovered that it has anti-diabetic uh, properties. But people on metformin have less diabetes, have less uh, heart disease, have less Alzheimer, have less cancer, and they even leave have their mortality, mortality of people with diabetes on metformin is less than people without diabetes. So this is an important tool to show that we can target aging and then lots of drugs will be developed in combination and we can really achieve what we're trying to So the idea really behind this is, uh, is there something controlling the hallmarks of aging? Is there something that goes wrong over time that could potentially be reset? And over 25 years uh, that I've been working in this field, working on little yeast cells that make bread and beer all the way up to humans, uh, what the data is pointing to is that one of the major drivers of aging is the loss of what we call epigenetic information. And briefly what that means is, uh, we have two types of information out in our body. We have the genome, which is the DNA, and then we have the control systems, which are the epige which is the epigenome. Um, an analogy would be the a compact disc where the music is the genome and, and the, the information in the DNA. It's very robust. And then the epigenome is the reader to read the right songs at the right time. And aging, uh, I think of as scratches on the CD, so you cannot read the right songs at the right time. Or in the case of the cell, you cannot read the right genes at the right time. And that that's what we call epigenetic decay. And that might be a root cause of aging that leads to many other problems that we've talked about. And drugs like metformin slow down the accumulation of the scratches and perhaps even erase some of them, which is exciting. But the most exciting part about this theory, if it's correct, is that the music in, of our cells is still there. If we polish those scratches, we can get back the youthful music of our lives. And that's what we're trying to do now uh, at the forefront of this field. Uh, we and a few other labs work on a molecule that we naturally make a lot of when we're young. It's called NAD for short. Uh, for long, it's nicotinamide and dinucleotide. I mean, it's a molecule that keeps us alive. Without NAD, we're dead in 30 seconds. It's required for mitochondria, the power packs to work, among other many reactions. And metformin is, is playing a role in, in that. NAD is, is important also, not just for energy, but for regulating a set of longevity factors called the sirtuins that we've worked on for many years. And as we get older, we make less of this molecule, NAD, and we think that our defenses get less and less. And you can accelerate this decline in NAD by not exercising and eating too much. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is make drugs that will raise the levels of NAD back up to youthful levels and get the body to fight as though we'd been running marathons and eating perfectly. And those drugs are actually in multiple clinical trials across the US. Um, there are many others by the way. There's rapamycin near mentioned that mimics low protein diets, which seems to be very effective in animals and seemingly in people as well to rejuvenate. And there's a growing list of molecules that are either in labs or in human clinical trials that look really promising so that metformin and rapamycin won't be the only ones on the market that we can access shortly. But but le let me uh, take you back to a previous Vatican conference where uh, Biden and the Pope were the keynote speaker. And Biden came, he was vice president then. 
and he came and he had the Moonshot Cancer Initiative. And I'll tell you, cancer is so much more complex than aging. Okay, it's really a problem because every cancer is different than the cells in your body. It's different than any other cancer. It's a huge problem. And aging is actually a quite simple uh, thing to do. The challenges are not at all, except that if you prevent aging, you don't only prevent cancer, you prevent many other age-related diseases. So it's clearly the future. In fact, the Pope said, after Biden's talk, he said, you know, I still hope that there is just a little pill that will cure cancer in everyone. And I think metformin is as close as it comes. It's already existing. So uh, 20, you know, the only thing, you know, the, the unfortunately, the, the, the animal that lives almost the longest proportionally is turtle. Okay. And the turtle, the problem is very slow. <laughs> and, 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 and really the, the, uh, you know, the rate is not as, as great as it should be, or we hope it would be. But I think that 20 years, there'll be all those drugs that have been repurposed and totally new uh, mechanisms and new approach that it will extend lifespan very significantly. And I'm not sure that 120 needs to be really uh, uh, the limit, although this is kind of our maximal lifespan as a species, but you know, Well, uh, uh, briefly, what, what we need to do is enhance what we're all, already doing as a field. In the last 10 years, we've gone from just a bunch of scientists at conferences and really very few people listening, uh, and thanks in part to books that are being written by, by you guys. Um, the public has woken up, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people have realized that addressing aging is the biggest impact we can have on human health by far. If you smoke, your chances of lung cancer go up fivefold but aging from 20 to 70 increases it over a hundred fold. So aging is the major cause of not just cancer, but most suffering on the planet. So if we can address that, it would be a huge economic benefit and also social benefit. Um, and we'd have money left over to tackle these other big problems. So this is a really global uh, and important initiative, but we need a grassroots effort. We need more investment in research. There's very little investment into aging biology compared to cancer and heart disease. Um, and tackling one disease at a time has actually led to problems. We can keep the heart alive for a long time, but the brain still ages. And our approach is the opposite. We want to keep the whole body alive for longer. But getting to the developing or uh, you know, less fortunate world, we have to make drugs available and supplements that work uh, that are cheap. And metformin is a perfect example of a drug that's a few cents a day, if that. Um, and as technologies evolve, they will become cheaper and inventions that we make in our labs will uh, go off patent and eventually become cheap. And that's also the goal. Um, all of my colleagues believe that we're not trying to make money here. We are trying to leave the world a better place and that will happen.